I don't think there's any topic in video games that has been discussed as thoroughly as From Software's boss catalog. There are videos dissecting quality, difficulty, musical design, artistic design, how effective Dark Souls bosses would be in a modern workplace environment, and even rankings of the boss's feet because this is the internet and God died here long ago. After doing a run where I went out of my way to beat all 161 bosses in Elden Ring, I've gone back and replayed every game in From Software's catalog, with the exception of Demon Souls, to get a fresh look at this series I love so dearly. I figured I'd make this series of videos along with it, as a critical analysis of each boss within this spiritual series. What does the boss try to accomplish, how does the designer try to reach that goal, and how well do they succeed? We're going to work our way in chronological order through the games, from Dark Souls to Dark Souls 2, to Bloodborne to Dark Souls 3 to Sekiro, and ending with an analysis of the bosses of Elden Ring. Without further ado, let's permanently ruin this poor undead's face and dive into the world of Dark Souls. Before the Asylum Demon, the game only throws a couple of punching bags your way, allowing you to learn the basics of the controls. But it's not until this guy drops in that you are put against your first real enemy. One of my favorite parts about this boss's introduction is the music. Though the song is nothing special within the series library, there's absolutely no buildup in the piece. There is this sudden escalation of danger that immediately panics a first-time player. In terms of animation, the Asylum Demon does a great job immediately selling the player on its physical power. Every attack creates this cloud of rubble and dust, as well as generates a pretty significant screen-shaking effect. If you get hit by any of the attacks, your character goes flying back from the force of the blow. And then once you attack for the first time with your broken straight sword and realize you are dealing no damage, it makes you feel completely unprepared. The game forces the player to retreat further into the asylum, get their weapons, and loop back around to the top floor of the room to begin the boss fight in earnest. The player starts looking down at the asylum demon, which not only sets up the obvious plunging attack tutorial, but works in a great way with the asylum demon's design. The asylum demon is, to put it lightly, bottom heavy. When you're looking up at it, it looks huge, your character feels small compared to it, but when you look down at it and its tiny little head, the demon feels much smaller, much more beatable. When you land a plunging attack, you will shatter around half the health bar instantly. The Asylum Demon is brought down to the player's level. If you can do that in one hit, then you just need to hit him a couple more times and you can finish the fight. And that ends up being the case. It doesn't take too much pressure for the Asylum Demon to fold. All you need is a weapon, and the impossible becomes pretty simple. The Asylum Demon's moveset can be broken down into two main attack types. The first is some general swinging of its hammer. All these attacks are well telegraphed, and the entire body of the demon moves, which makes it pretty easy to tell what's happening, even when the attack is off screen. The player can block these attacks, but the starting shields are not particularly great. The game very much wants to encourage you to roll through these. Once you start rolling, the same animation tricks that made the Asylum Demon feel powerful suddenly make the roll feel powerful. The second attack type is this get off me butt slam that he does. And again, it does its job really well. You cannot roll through this attack. If you don't move away, you will get hit and you will get knocked down. There's enough of a window though that an experienced player has time to punish after he does the attack and new players won't ever be fully comboed this early in the game, while still driving home the importance of reacting through positioning and not just rolling. This entire moveset is built really well to drill in the fundamentals of rolling and positioning right from the start. This encounter is a great example of something being much more than the sum of its parts. The music bursting in the first time versus you starting the music the second time, running away, getting the weapons, the design of the boss, making it feel massive and then making it feel small, and everything the moveset does to teach all creates this incredible initial experience for the player. I'd say that the Asylum Demon does deserve an A grade. Anyone who started the series with Dark Souls can attest to how good that first boss defeated screen feels, and the Asylum Demon is a great way to start off a really solid game. Outside of the tutorial, the Taurus Demon is the boss most players will encounter first in their casual playthrough. Examined as an enemy, the Taurus Demon is underwhelming at best. Most of his attacks have two halves, an initial slam followed by the demon's steps. 
You can dodge the main swing perfectly, but then still be knocked out of the end of your roll or a follow-up attack just by being too close to the demon. Combining this with the returning dust cloud effect, and it makes the fight often feel visually cluttered and all the animations feel messy. As you've likely already noticed by the footage, the camera in this fight is an absolute mess. The demon's knees move the player, occasionally even damaging them, and the camera has no idea how to handle it. On top of that, the gap in the Taurus demon's legs makes it easy to swing and miss at point-blank range. After the Asylum demon used the simplicity of its attacks to create a more polished fight, the Taurus demon feels overcomplicated with extra hitboxes where they really don't need to be. The designer's main intent with the boss, however, comes in via the arena, which amplifies this otherwise underwhelming battle. The bridge is claustrophobic and it makes it easy to feel trapped, particularly with how large all the Taurus demon's hitboxes are. On top of that, there are two archers behind you that shoot at you if you haven't taken them out, and they won't start shooting at you until you're far enough in the first time that the Taurus demon is already there to start attacking. However, they aren't there as an irritation, they're actually there to help provide you other strategies to take down the Taurus demon. Not only can you use plunging attacks on the Taurus demon as well, you can also lure the Taurus demon to jump onto the tower to have a fight in that more open environment. This kind of creative arena design is excellent and makes an otherwise forgettable fight carry some real weight. This is not a Taurus demon, this is the Taurus demon fought on the castle rampart in Undead Burg. It feels unique. Particularly for bosses who later turn into basic enemies or have a rematch, arena design like this makes the encounter still feel like a boss fight on later playthroughs. Combining with this, the fight is fully optional. If the player knows where to go, they just don't need to deal with it, which makes the Taurus demon feel like a learning tool for new players. Returning to some minuses, however, the music in this fight fails to be as engaging as it was with the Asylum demon. It's the exact same song, and it tries to use the same trick of the music starting after the demon lands, but it just doesn't work as well. If the player decides to stand and wait for the Taurus demon on top of the tower, the music just starts to feel like background noise, and you never want that with a soundtrack, particularly in a game that uses its soundtrack so sparsely. Without the arena, the Taurus demon would earn a D grade. But with the creative arena encouraging player choice and experimentation, I think it does bring itself up to the middle of the pack with a low C grade. The Asylum Demon tries to guide players into the game, and the Taurus Demon tries to encourage them to examine their environment and resources to gain an advantage. The Bell Gargoyles is when Dark Souls takes the gloves off and gives you your first major challenge. Not only are they a massive leap up in difficulty as enemies, but they are the first dual boss fight of the game. On my first playthrough, I had to fully restart the game to prepare better for this massive spike in difficulty. The Bell Gargoyles are the first boss in the game with a cutscene introducing them. Though the cutscene itself isn't anything particularly special, it does do a pretty effective job not only setting up the threat of this boss, but in telling the player exactly what they're here for by showing the bell that they've been told to ring. In a game that so rarely gives direction, telling you that you're heading in the right direction is a nice boost for new players who are definitely about to struggle against these stone foes. The Bell Gargoyles do far less damage on each individual strike than the demons, but make up for it with a much faster attack speed. Where the demons often swing once and leave themselves open, their gargoyles swing two or three times, flying into the air to avoid counterattacks or even attacking behind them with bladed tails. The attacks are usually pretty fun to dodge, but I do want to make an exception for this flyby attack. The camera struggles to follow what's happening, and the actual swing of the attack has very little wind up for when it's starting. There's less rubble and dust generated by the attacks, which does do a great job making the boss visually clear, especially once it becomes more chaotic. Though the gargoyles can be fought from any real direction, the move sets wide arcs, encourage players to get behind the gargoyles, and go for their tail, often taking it off to get a long stagger. Once the first gargoyle is at half health, the second spawns in. If the player gets a stagger, then a tail cut, it is possible to burst down the first gargoyle, but a new player still figuring out their weapons will usually struggle to execute that correctly. The second makes the fight much more demanding, but each gargoyle has a completely separate AI. The first prefers melee attacks, while the second prefers to breathe fire, blocking off portions of the arena. This attack leaves it very vulnerable, or lets you lure the first gargoyle away, particularly with its fast closing speed. 
Their flying attack fails here as well. Their gargoyles ironically don't cover much distance when they're flying, which makes it hard to separate them if one decides to use that attack. And if both the gargoyles attack in melee, their wide, fast attacks make it almost impossible to break in and punish them. You really need to play their tempo, which is something that I've never really liked from dual fights, but that may be personal preference. The Bell Gargoyles do a pretty effective job at ensuring the player has a good weapon, introduces fighting two bosses at a time, and continues the Taurus Demon's trend of encouraging coming up with a strategy in advance. Rush down the first, cut its tail, go for the stagger, or go for the fire breather. Despite the few faults of overlapping attacks and that frustrating flyby attack that I probably hate way more than I should, I think the Bell Gargoyles do earn a B grade. I mentioned during the Taurus Demon the importance of a boss built from later enemies having a unique arena to set them apart from their later encounters. The Capra Demon is not what I meant. This boss has the opposite problem of the Taurus Demon. I'd even argue the Capra Demon is a better individual enemy than the Taurus Demon, but the arena in this fight is so atrocious that it puts the fight not only in contention for the worst fight in the whole game, but in the series as a whole. Dual-wielding butcher knives, the demon's attacks are well telegraphed but fast. They encourage rolling in and through the attacks to land punishment on this easily staggerable enemy. He's large enough to be intimidating, but small enough that he never hits with attacks from off-screen. Unfortunately, those are the only positive things I have to say at all about this absolutely, astronomically insulting encounter. Firstly, the atmosphere is underwhelming. You're traveling through thin alleys of bandits and dogs, and upon reaching the boss, you find just another demon who also has some dogs. The Taurus Demon felt out of place in his arena, yes, but the open space made it feel like a raging monster who stumbled into this castle rampart. Uh, the Capra Demon sits in a dead end in an alleyway, again, with two pet dogs for some reason. The demon music at this point has also completely worn its welcome, as the Capra Demon is now the third out of the first four bosses using the same soundtrack. The only way to break aggression is to head up this staircase, which also has its visibility blocked by that tree, and drop onto the top of this aqueduct. This is the best area to fight and kill the dogs, but if you don't have a weapon that attacks vertically, you'll just hit the wall instead of the dogs, and of course if you do that, that can be an instant game over, as the dogs also apply bleed, which at this level will instantly kill you. But the worst part is this wall. It might be strange to complain about more space in such a frustratingly crammed arena, but this space is somehow the most lethal space on the map. The ceiling is so low that the camera stops functioning entirely, clips into the wall, and generally freaks out, and the Capra Demon can, again, attack through these pillars. If you get trapped in here, you are, once again, just going to die. As I said, the Capra Demon is an alright boss in terms of raw design and it is completely ruined by the arena and dogs. This fight is an easy F grade. Many people use the master key to skip Blight Town and its low frame rate, but I use the master key to skip Capra Demon, who is without a doubt the most significant stain in the entire early game of Dark Souls. The Gaping Dragon is a strange boss fight to analyze. This is, in my opinion, the first boss to really use spectacle to bring the experience together. You climb your way to the bottom of the depths, looking down at this massive arena the whole time, and as soon as you make it down, this cutscene does a great job selling you on the scale of this abomination. This thing, more than any other boss up to this point, feels like a boss fight. Its damage one-shots most builds, particularly if you haven't found and killed the channeler that buffs it, and it has infinitely more health than any creature that you could have encountered up to this point. In terms of moveset, though, there's not much going on. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, though. He swipes in front of him, he jumps into the air to slam down, and he vomits to damage your equipment, or he does this slam your face down and charge across the arena. That's your biggest opportunity to hit the face for more damage, and a huge window to attack him after the charge. Personally, I think the charge does a pretty good job. It's slower paced, yes, but the Gaping Dragon isn't a fast monster, and it doesn't need to be. It's just a hundred times your size, and it walks with enough intent to kill you in a single hit. On the other hand, the hitboxes on the charge are not great, which 
when it does as much damage as it does can be pretty frustrating. I mentioned the channeler before, but I don't think it actually does very much to make this boss fight better. It stands at the top and it buffs the Gaping Dragon's damage, and then also uses Soul Arrow to snipe at you. Once you're in the arena, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to loop back around after dying and kill the channeler separately. The archers for the Taurus Demon were in the arena and something you could learn about and adjust for your general approach. Enemies like this, hidden in areas as maze-like as the depths, don't really add much. The Gaping Dragon is hard to analyze. The moveset feels too simple in a vacuum, but the simplicity means that the whole body not being on screen isn't a problem, which lets the scale work. The damage also doesn't feel very balanced, but again, it leads towards that spectacle, makes it feel different than the rest of the bosses you've been fighting up to this point. It ends up being a nice change of pace from the rest of the early game bosses, who are all very simple tests of rolling and punishing, whereas this one focuses much more on positioning. Overall, I think the Gaping Dragon does earn a low B grade. It stumbles a lot, and there are a lot of things I can say are wrong, but I just really enjoy the fight. Quaylog is the first real mid-game challenge that Dark Souls throws at the player. She has a massive health pool, does a ton of damage for how fast she attacks, and entering her arena without being poisoned is far easier said than done, so you'll likely not even have a full set of Estus going into this already long fight. Similarly to Gaping Dragon, she feels much more unique than the roster of demons that make up the rest of the early game bosses. The spider half of her body in particular is grotesque in this beautiful way, and the sound effects of the claws clicking across the stone floor add this great sense of dread to the fight, and works really well with the more ethereal soundtrack. The concept of a wide open arena made more difficult to navigate via lingering lava pools is an easy to understand gimmick that sets her apart from the usual game of slapping bosses in their ass. She's a fairly stationary boss, so most of the challenge of the encounter is how to get past her attacks and punish her while not getting caught in any area bursts or lava pools. Where Quaylog stumbles the most, however, is her moveset. Her sword swipes do have this satisfying fire effect that does make the sword visually stand out against the busy spider, but the issue is that her entire body spins almost on a dime in order to aim at the player. It doesn't feel natural and ends up making the best place to avoid the sword just inside the spider's legs, which isn't really a fun place to stand. She also has two AoE attacks. One is the spider lifting up its legs and slamming them down, where the other is a burst that comes from her humanoid body. I really like the leg slam, but the burst from the body ends up being more frustrating than anything else. The tell is her human body casting something, which considering where you need to stand to avoid the sword attacks, is a little too small a tell for how deadly an attack is. A good tell needs to have a clear cause and effect, and the spider just tightening a little looks too much like the boss moving around normally. Combined with that, depending on where the legs go, it's easy to get trapped inside, and it makes the explosion feel like forced damage. With that said, Quaylog is an iconic boss for a reason. She feels like a culmination of every demon who came before and stands out in the early game as a momentous foe. The atmosphere and tension created by Blight Town come to a head here, and with even the small issues in her moveset, I still think she is a fun boss to take down every time. I don't think she quite earns an A grade, but she definitely earns a solid upper B grade. The Moonlight Butterfly is an interesting concept for an encounter, but doesn't land quite how the developers hoped, I imagine. Unlike most bosses, the Butterfly traps the player into a passive playstyle. The player is trapped on a thin bridge that might as well be two-dimensional, and the Butterfly alternates between three different spells before eventually landing to heal a little bit and allow melee builds to deal damage before it ends with an AoE burst and does the whole loop again. The initial atmosphere of the fight is definitely the highlight. The Butterfly looks gorgeous and fits the aesthetic of the garden perfectly. The softer, more mystical music feels beautifully disquieting, and it adds a lot to the atmosphere. However, this atmosphere also overstays its welcome. Once the butterfly has finished the loop once, the fight just starts to drag on. I fought it very early, this playthrough, and the fight was mind-numbingly boring. Even though my health was low enough that damage was an actual risk, 
It took three phases, and the butterfly's attacks just weren't engaging enough to justify the gimmick. The first attack is the three orbs. They'll track the player, requiring a well-timed roll to get through them, or a block with a high magic defense shield. Making the attack hit three times also allows for partial dodges, which does work well. The tracking can occasionally feel a little funky, but it's overall probably the best of her attacks. The second attack is two shots of grid needles, and this is probably her weakest. There are two variations, one that uses the player character as a target for the bottom needle, and one that places the needles to the side of the player to catch a roll. The only issue is there is no visible difference between the two, and the attack comes out so fast you can't react. Sometimes just strafing is enough, other times you'll get hit. The designers were definitely hoping to encourage blocking here, but blocking the butterfly isn't fun. It attacks so slowly, stamina recovery is never a concern. You just hold up your shield when it's attacking and put it down when it's not, and you're fine. The final attack does do a little bit better here. It's a laser beam that the butterfly drags across the arena. The timing on this is a little strange, but at least it's consistently strange, so once you get it down, it never becomes much of a problem again. The issue with all of these attacks is none of them are dynamic. You roll towards the orbs, you roll towards the laser, or you block the needles, which will sometimes just miss you. Then it lands, you attack, and then it goes back up. The atmosphere stays stagnant, and it makes the fight kind of a slog. Considering the amount of souls it gives, fighting it after the Battle Gargoyles is about when you're expected to face it, but it is such a tedious fight that it's honestly better kept until where I put it here, where it stops being a challenge. The butterfly earns a degrade. Now this might be a hot take, but I really enjoy the Iron Golem. I think it exemplifies every positive of a good Dark Souls boss. It has a varied move set, it interacts with the arena in an interesting way, and most importantly, it makes death really fucking funny. The Iron Golem's theme, to start, goes way harder than it has any right to. It's aggressive and boisterous in a way most other themes just aren't. The Dark Souls soundtrack leans often towards longer, legato notes, while Iron Golem uses these staccato choral chords to feel angry in a real fun way. There's three big pieces of the arena that come into play in the fight's design as well. First, like the gaping dragon, the giant above the arena continuously attacks you if you don't kill it, forcing you to fight on a thin bridge. This, however, is a much more effective enemy. It's far easier to find if you want it dead, but the timing is much more regular, and fighting on the bridge is often more helpful to the player than the golem. The second piece of the arena that really sticks out is that the environment is really unique. Despite looking melee focused, the Iron Golem is capable of some fast moving ranged attacks, and if you're in the open space, there are piles of rubble that stopped ranged attacks but don't limit your movement. This is one of my favorite uses of cover in the game. It keeps the arena feeling open while still encouraging interesting positioning. The final environmental twist is the tight bridge. Similar to Taurus Demon, the Iron Golem takes up the entire bridge, but unlike the Taurus Demon, the Iron Golem has hitboxes that makes sense, and the tells for its surprisingly varied moveset are all clear and easy to read. Like the Asylum Demon, the Iron Golem makes every action take over its entire body. It adjusts its footing, it leans back into its attacks, and more small details like that really come together in a fun, culminating way here. The camera also does pretty well. The lock-on selects the Iron Golem's legs, avoiding the bad camera angle that Taurus Demon fell into. But of course, no conversation on the Iron Golem is complete without bringing up the third party in this fight, gravity. The Iron Golem loves to fling you off the cliff to your death, which I personally find absolutely hilarious. You can position yourself to avoid it since he always throws you down directly in front of him, but all his hits knock you back, which makes a well-timed roll even more important. The best part about this fight, though, is there is a built-in mechanic for knocking him off the bridge to his instant death. Once you deal enough stagger damage, he enters this wobbly pose. If you attack him enough here, he stumbles back from the direction you hit him. If you position yourself right, he tumbles off the cliff to his death. I do think that the wobbling phase lasts a little too long. It reaches a point that it starts to just look funny as he just keeps wobbling. 
There's a nice window to punish the Iron Golem even if you don't kill him with the knockdown, which still makes a nice reward for all players. My favorite part of this design though is that if you're standing where you can knock him off the cliff, you'll be putting yourself at risk of exactly the same thing. He may be a simple boss, but the amount of fun interaction packed in gives the Iron Golem an A grade in my book. And here they are, Ugstug and Smug, the dynamic duo, the power couple, the sentient wall and guardian of the late game, and a boss I believe doesn't get called out for their faults near often enough. To start with the good, the atmosphere is incredible. The musical sting during the cutscene, combined with the incredible pose, sells these two as a massive threat and they immediately make good on that promise. In terms of their movesets, Ornstein and Smo are both expertly designed. Starting with Ornstein, his attacks are slow and deliberate when at close range, which allows for these large punishing windows. Combined with being easily staggerable and his low health pool, Ornstein is an obvious choice for the player's first target. To make it better, Ornstein has this fast dash attack. If you successfully dodge it, he has completely separated himself from Smo, which makes him very easy to punish. He also has this ranged lightning bolt, which you can use the pillars to absorb, a theme that we will be seeing a lot in design in this fight. Smo has plenty of tools of his own. Beyond the obvious jump and slam attacks and the usual swing, Smo's bread and butter is this charge attack. It also gets stopped by the pillar, but it travels the entire arena as an active hitbox before ending with an uppercut that's very hard to roll through. At far range, this is a great move for such a slow enemy. It closes the gap in an engaging way, forcing you to attempt a narrow dodge window or give him space. Overall, it's a pretty well-balanced duo battle. Neath your opponent feels overtuned, and there are moves built in to separate them pretty well. However, there are some problems that I don't feel get spoken about enough, particularly in this phase. There's a sweet spot where both their AIs can get stuck in a loop where it's really hard to actually punish them. Ornstein won't charge because you're too close, but Smo will keep charging because you're far enough away, which means the two of them end up sitting on each other and make it so you can't hit either. And the only way out is to either run away or take a hit to change how their AIs are thinking. Second, and much more egregiously, Ornstein's pathing in his charge is an absolute mess. His dash can get stuck on rubble, stay in place, stop completely, restart suddenly, and be generally frustrating. Considering this move is the linchpin in separating the two from a design standpoint, the fact it doesn't work can completely break an otherwise pretty well balanced first phase, particularly with how easy it is to die and how easy it is to get them to overlap. The second phase, in my mind, is where the fight really shines. After one dies, the other absorbs their power in their own unique way, gaining attributes of the other and restoring their health to full. Smo's damage gets much higher, and his butt slam gains this massive lightning AoE, but other than that, he's still the same general opponent. Super Ornstein, who I don't have any footage of, is far more difficult. I went with Smo for this run, because he's much easier, but Ornstein grows to become even larger than Smo does, his attacks cover far more range, his mobility becomes significantly more dangerous when combined with the size, Though it makes for an engaging enemy, it does slightly throw off the balance of the fight. Ornstein's easier to take out in the first phase, but he's also the harder option for the second phase, so there's no real reason not to take him out first unless you specifically want his item. I personally think that the boss fight should have been designed that if you take out the easier enemy first, you get a harder second phase, and vice versa, but that comes down to personal preference. The amount of flexibility and personal expression in Ornstein and Smo, particularly considering the weight that defeating them has, unlocking fast travel, and opening up the entire second half of the game, makes them feel like an incredible obstacle the player has overcome. Beating Ornstein and Smo means you can beat this entire game, and the player feels that because however they took down Ornstein and Smo was unique to them. No one has the same first experience. There is so much personal investment in this fight that they are infinitely memorable, and it makes people look past all those small flaws. It's what makes Ornstein and Smo so incredible. Despite this, however, I still think Ornstein and Smo aren't among the best of the best of Dark Souls bosses. Their role in the game is one of the best of the best, 
but as a boss, I think they earn a high A grade. Their excellent atmosphere, arena interacting moves, and their unique second phase lifts them up, but bizarre pathing and AI overlap keeps them from those highest honors in my personal book. Gwendolyn is one of the few gimmick bosses in the game, sharing both the theme and the gimmick with the Moonlight Butterfly. But unlike the Butterfly, Gwendolyn manages to serve as a successful change of pace from the standard boss formula. First, the dialogue and atmosphere in this fight can vary pretty wildly depending on if you fought him by turning Anne or Londo to nighttime, or if you found a specific ring in a specific side cul-de-sac in the Tomb of the Giants. Since I didn't want to bother with the Tomb of the Giants any more than I needed to, I went for the dark version in this playthrough, which is a shame, as Gwendolyn definitely works visually better in the sunlight, and most players who find him will probably find him in the dark. As I mentioned, Gwendolyn and the Butterfly are both iterations of the same gimmick, but with one major difference that makes Gwendolyn infinitely more successful. The Butterfly requires you to use either ranged attacks or patience as he uses his three ranged attacks that you must evade to punish him. Gwendolyn will use three ranged attacks to try to take you down from a distance, and it's now up to you to chase him down this endless hallway. Range doesn't cheese it like the butterfly because you need to get close enough to use your spells, bow, or melee. You are in control of the pace of Gwendolyn, whereas the butterfly was in control of its pace. This creates a much more interesting fight, even with Gwendolyn constantly running away and only having three limited attacks, being able to chase after him puts you in so much more control as a player, which is a huge step up from the violently boring butterfly. Gwendolyn's three moves are either shooting a barrage of arrows that need to either be walked through or blocked with a pillar, a magic barrage that is very brutal to dodge but can be blocked entirely again by standing behind a pillar, or the only attack that's easy to roll through as a magic burst that also goes through the pillar. With all these combined, it creates an interesting back and forth. You're safe from most attacks behind the pillar, but you can't progress. If you hide too close to him, you'll miss your window of opportunity as he teleports back again, but you can use some of his attacks to get a longer string of attacks against him. You can occasionally get some frustrating teleports that feel like you never have a chance to attack, but I feel like that adds to the back and forth. It's hard for gimmick bosses to stand alongside the rest of the more complicated roster, but Gwendolyn does stand with a solid showing against more detailed bosses. I think they earn a solid B grade. The Asylum Demon may have been the first enemy you fought, but the Stray Demon was the first enemy you saw. As an upgraded version of a tutorial boss with a revamped moveset, guarding a Titanite slab and access to the Painted World, as well as a great arena that amplifies the boss's threat, the Stray Demon justifies itself as a reskin. The core concept of the moveset is similar, but there is a few massive changes. First, the Stray Demon loves to use its jump attack, and its range with the staff is much longer than the Asylum Demon's hammer. In addition, there are two new moves. In AoE, where the demon plunges the staff into the ground using Quelag's AoE abilities, and a slash followed by a disjointed burst of that same energy. On top of that, you fall into the Stray Demon's arena, which means you start the fight at half hit points. Considering how fast the Stray Demon can attack, they can pretty handily shatter that with a single attack. The combination of the new area attacks, a smaller arena starting at a disadvantage, all of it does a great job to make the Stray Demon intimidating again. One weakness of the Asylum Demon is a lot more noticeable. It's pretty easy to get the demon in a loop of doing the butt slam over and over again. Considering it's his easiest move to dodge by a pretty wide margin and how fun some of his new moves are, this is a pretty disappointing AI issue. With that said, reaching the Stray Demon early is a terrifying concept. The Stray Demon is the boss I died to the most in this playthrough, namely because I stupidly decided to fight him right after Quelog, so I didn't have to go back to Anne Orlando a second time, which meant my damage and health were far lower than they should have been. Even with that, the Stray Demon goes to show the simple staying power of the Asylum Demon's design. Despite being a reskin, I still think the Stray Demon earns itself a low B grade. 
The next optional fight is a fascinating encounter, and it's not really possible to talk about the experience of the encounter without going into the story. After you trap yourself in the painted world, you eventually manage to struggle your way through what is one of the most detailed areas in the game to reach this arena. Priscilla asks you to walk past her and leave, referencing that everyone in the painted world is here for a reason and you don't belong. If I wasn't collecting footage, I honestly wouldn't attack her. She's not a monster, she's not some grand boss, she is the person guarding the exit to the painted world. But there's got to be something under this narration, so I guess she's dying this playthrough. Once you hit Priscilla, she goes invisible. This is a fascinating gimmick, but I'm not a big fan. You're supposed to watch for her footsteps in the snow, but sometimes the footsteps don't show up, and some of the arena doesn't have snow in it, which can make it a frustrating endeavor to find her. Once you stagger her, however, she's not too impressive either. She has a couple telegraphed scythe swings, a frost breath that is incredibly easy to punish, and she can technically go invisible again, but she probably won't have the opportunity. I understand that her moveset was simplified to make her fair to fight invisible, but I wish breaking the invisibility escalated the fight in some way. Maybe she'd have unique attacks or start doing additional effects with her attacks, but as it stands, the gimmick is less a part of the fight and more a mild inconvenience when it starts. There's not a sense of cohesiveness with the rest of the fight, and the actual battle itself struggles because of that. However, the atmosphere of an invisible enemy combined with the unique introduction of the boss still makes the encounter a memorable moment. With the failures of the battle itself, I can't give it higher than a C grade. I sure hope you like these 10 seconds of footage because that's the entire fight. And I did Nito's Lord Soul first. I want to love Pinwheel. This arena is atmospheric, and the mechanic of clones as Pinwheel is in this confined space is a fun evolution of Demon Souls' Fool's Idol, and his music is in contention for one of my favorite tracks in the game. However, considering how little he can defend himself, we're not trapped in there with him. He's trapped in here with us. Maybe the games wanted players to be able to fight him early for the Rite of Kindling, but the Catacombs are one of the most difficult, complicated to navigate areas in the entire game, and I'm still not sure I could climb back reliably without the Lord Vessel even after multiple playthroughs of the game. I suppose I should be grateful he's as easy as he is, since getting through the Catacombs in the first half of the Tomb of Giants combined with an actual boss would be an insane ask of a player. Maybe they just forgot a zero. Maybe the catacombs were too hard for playtesters and Pinwheel got nerfed. Maybe they thought people would fight him early for some reason. We'll never know, and he gets a degrade. Before I start showing footage of Gravelord Nido, please note that I am well aware I did not deserve to win this fight. This is, without a doubt, my sloppiest fight in not only this playthrough, but in the entire series. The Lord Souls in general are pretty disappointing fights, as a bit of a spoiler. Nido is definitely one of the better Lord Souls, but for someone introduced as Death itself, capable of raising his hands and turning dragons to ash, Nido is kind of an idiot. The threat in this fight is these hordes of skeletons. I stayed at the entrance to the arena, so I didn't get the giant skeletons angry at me, but these things are resurrected infinitely unless you upgrade a weapon with the divine ember you got from beating the Moonlight Butterfly. Thankfully, Nido really enjoys blowing up and killing his own skeletons. The agreed upon strategy for winning is put on stone armor and ignore the skeletons, stabbing Nido repeatedly instead of using any actual strategy. For a late game boss in a game about learning movesets, that's not great. They made death and they gave him this incredible and unique design and then managed to make how he fights be as boring as possible. Taurus Demon attacks with more aggression than this guy. I suppose I'm glad he doesn't fall into the same trap as Capra Demon and his dogs, but I don't really give Nito any points for not failing. Though he's a disappointment in every way, he's not insulting, so he can enjoy his degrade. I think it says a lot that the Ceaseless Discharge, who is, spoiler, not a great boss, is 
probably the best boss in Lost Isleth. That's the level of quality the Bed of Chaos' area has, and so we're going to be a little negative for a couple more fights here. Ceaseless Discharge has a lot of interesting ideas, but fails to deliver on a lot of the concepts. The boss is massive, and you do actually fight it despite its size. However, its attacks never feel like it takes advantage of its size, and you can never get a good look at the full boss, robbing it of the moment of spectacle that bosses like Gaping Dragon relied on. The boss attacks fast enough to not be boring, but the attacks themselves do leave a lot to be desired. They come out too slowly to be lethal to any build, and there isn't enough variation in them. On top of that, it's tough to see what's happening most of the time, which means dodging is more of a matter of memorizing strange delayed tells than any actual skill or instinct. Killing him lowers the lava, which is a unique twist on the usual boss in terms of progressing, whether it's blocking your path or it has a key and it does set the encounter apart and tie into the scale of the demon pretty well. There's a lot of interesting ideas, as I said, but at the end of the day, Ceaseless Discharge roars, slams, you roll, and either you get hit, you stand up and smack him, or you don't, and you smack him anyway, and you just repeat this until he dies. There's no variation, there's no build throughout the fight, it's just the same attacks over and over and over again. I fought Ceaseless Discharge right after Quaylog this place, and I'm hoping to avoid my usual strategy of just face tanking him, but even without endgame health and damage and being limited to 10 Estus, Ceaseless Discharge could not kill me. I want to like Ceaseless Discharge, he's such a unique boss in this lineup, but I can barely justify giving him a D grade. It seems every time we run back into the Asylum Demon, he's worse than he was the last time. Demon Fire Sage is effectively just stray demon, except made worse by placement in the world and his arena. In Dark Souls, the only rematched boss is the Asylum Demon, which is fought three times. The first time, as I've mentioned, is great, and the stray demon does serve as a nice hidden reward against a more powerful version of the tutorial. Now, a demon being in Lost Isleth does make sense, but it could have been literally anything else. Hell, you have to fight another demon immediately after this fight is finished, without a moment to pause, without another room, that's just another demon right after. I don't understand why we needed another fight against the Asylum Demon when there was already a demon here. Second and more directly crippling to the fight itself, the arena is not great. When fighting the stray demon, you were in a small box, it made running away almost impossible, but that also meant weaving behind the demon was always an option. The demon fire sage's arena is absolutely massive, with far more space than you'd ever need, and is covered with branches that can stop your character from moving. Considering how important mobility is with the size of the AoEs, particularly considering how much he loves to attack from range, the fire sage completely disengages and just spams the same spells over and over again. The range on its jump is even longer than the stray demon, and getting caught on branches means getting hit because of how long the attack's hitbox lingers for. The stray demon got a pass for being a reskin, but the demon fire sage feels like an unnecessary boss, making its status as a reskin far more infuriating. The fundamental moves, however, do still work. So, though it brings up the bottom of the grade, the demon fire sage earns a D. I really hate this fight. I cannot overstate enough how much I absolutely loathe the Centipede Demon. There is nothing this fight does correctly, and I would be more than pleased if I never had to see it again. Firstly, we've reached the end game, and it's just another demon. The design seems alright, but there's so much happening everywhere, there's not really a clear through line for what this monster is. That said, I'm not too much of a character designer myself, so I won't dig too deep into that. What I can analyze is the gameplay, which is bad. First, you only have these small islands to stand on. Outside of the islands, there is painfully bright lava that will kill you almost instantly unless you wear the ring that you get from the centipede demon. So, you stand on these islands and you wait for the centipede demon only to learn it has a at range attack that comes back fast enough that it cannot be realistically punished. The centipede demon can do this as long as it wants. On top of that, if you don't make this jump to the center island, the first island is so pressed up against the wall, the camera will get caught on it, and the camera for the centipede demon is already bad enough. The lock-on, if you choose to use it, 
creates a spinning effect, and the centipede demon has so many moving parts and slams once it does get into melee that it is impossible to tell what is going on when you're fighting. There are a lot of camera problems in Dark Souls, but the centipede demon is a heavy contender for being the worst point of the camera. Even if the camera did work, the moveset is not particularly exciting. He stomps, he jumps, and he grabs. Which, it should be noted, the camera is bad enough that if he grabs you at the wrong place in the arena, he will clip through the floor and kill himself. This boss is an absolute mess. Nothing it goes for works, it's not fun to fight, and the only memorability of the fight is its frustration. If I had to say something nice, it's that the run to the boss is about 15 seconds long. So, thanks, Centipede Demon. Enjoy your F grade. And culminating what is by far the worst section of the game, it is the infamous Bed of Chaos. And here is my hottest take in the video. The Bed of Chaos is not the worst boss in the game. Don't get me wrong, she is definitely still a low F grade boss, but there are strategies that can be taken to make the boss fight less painful, which many of the other F grade bosses don't have. First, and probably the best part of the fight, is this slide. This slide is better than all the F-grade bosses combined, and it lands you with this great view of the boss, and the lighting changes as you look up to behold it. It does make the fight seem initially cool. The distinction between phase 1, 2, and 3 within the fight are massive, and the game thankfully checkpoints after you reach each phase. Probably the best strategy for dealing with the Bed of Chaos's shenanigans is quitting out after you get each orb. Not only will this allow you to ride the slide again, which as I mentioned, is the best part of the fight, but you don't have to run back while unable to see the hand swinging to knock you into instant death pits. In phase 1 and 2, the only real method of death is being knocked into instant death pits. It's very fun, just some real exciting design right there. The hands do do a ridiculous amount of damage, yes, but they're going to hit you into the pit. Breaking the second of the two orbs is definitely the harder task. You have two choices, try to dodge through the bed of Chaos's attacks and reach the orb, or throw and shoot things at it. I decided not to hate myself today, and so I equipped myself with a bow. These kind of allowances are why the bed of Chaos is not at the bottom of my boss list. There are things you can do that do make it less painful. The last phase, however, is definitely the worst. The second phase added these fire scythe attacks, but they don't attack you if you're on the opposite side, which means they'll be a non-issue as you go to the opposite side to deal with the second orb. With the third phase needing you to go through the center, they can attack with their incredibly weird timing. There's also this firestorm spell when you're out and about, it's not too frustrating, but you need space to dodge it, particularly considering it can one-shot most builds and you have to walk through a very tight space to reach the end. To complete the final phase, you need to run forward, drop down onto a tree branch you can't see until you've reached the edge where you will be attacked, of course, and then run into the bed of chaos and slap it once. The biggest issue with this fight, in my opinion, is that the drop to the branch is atrocious. You can be hit while falling, which means you are completely dependent on whatever attack the bed tries to do. If it does the wrong attack, you die time to make an entire run back for the 13th time. Dark Souls is not built for fast-paced platforming, and this fight happily proves that point. Second, the bed's beard has hitboxes, and they can push you off the walkway or get you stuck so it can hit you and knock you off the walkway. I don't know why they did this. They did not need to do this. Someone specifically chose to code this beard to fuck with the player. This was an active choice. To no one's shock, the Bed of Chaos is in F grade. An attempt was certainly made, and there is a nice slide, and it's particularly more entertaining with John Cena's theme, and they did eventually patch in ways to get around their own nonsense, so yes, I don't think the Bed of Chaos is the worst boss in the game. In fact, I don't even think she's the worst Lord Soul. That honor goes to my personal least favorite boss in the game, Cethiscalus. People hate the Bed of Chaos, and rightfully so, but my first playthrough, this was the boss that I was the most disappointed with. Firstly, Seath has an incredible introduction. I mean, just look at this bloodstained, scaleless dragon screaming in rage while slaughtering the last vestiges of the race he betrayed. That is metal as fuck. Now, what's Seath look like in-game? An obese pile of blue rocks. 
Also, Seath has to kill you in your first encounter, where you are introduced to his primary gimmick, applying Curse to you. You know, that debuff that builds up ridiculously quickly without the right armor, instantly kills you, and then cuts your health in half until you go and find a unique item on the other side of the map? Makes for great, fun, and engaging gameplay. But worse than his horrid design, and worse than that irritating status effect is how Seath actually fights. Before getting to his moves, his arena is really bad. There is no fog gate the first time, and there are clams immediately outside, meaning they will come in and join the boss fight unless you kill each of them your first time through. The first time, you start on the opposite side of the arena, where you break this crystal that makes him mortal before realizing that you're surrounded. He suffers from a principle I lightly referenced earlier. He does not turn, he rotates, like leftovers in a microwave. When combined with his size, this entire rotation mechanic completely removes any intimidation factor that Seath might have had. His attacks, however, are where the fight goes from bad to atrocious. First, the camera cannot handle Seath. Learning his attacks is entirely learning sound cues or noticing small tells that are not in any way telling. On top of that, half the time, most of his attacks don't attack you, they attack your frame rate, dropping them even more than your walk through Blight Town. The one attack that you have to actually dodge requires you run away, but the arena isn't large enough to get away from it in time, meaning you have to minimize your curse buildup so you don't instantly die, then run back up to him and slap him some more. There is no depth, there is no back and forth, there's no dodging, there's no learning. This is my least favorite boss in Dark Souls. Not just because it is a horrid fight without a single positive quality, because the bed of chaos is also that, but the potential of Seath as a boss was sky high and the ball got absolutely dropped. Nothing was done right in this fight. Even the music is irritating. Have your F grade, Seath, and leave me alone. But after that fight, we are finally out of bad boss territory, and the game finally starts to come together with the great Grey Wolf Sif. In terms of gameplay, Sif is a decent boss. The name of the game here is rolling through her sword strikes to get underneath her to attack her legs and underbelly. She dodges around and is one of the fastest moving enemies in the base game, and she does some pretty hefty damage whenever she does manage to land a hit, which makes her a fairly intimidating opponent. The biggest mechanical struggle of the fight is the return of the iffy lock-on. With you needing to be under Sif, the camera struggles. Thankfully, her attacks are simple and have large tells, which avoids the chaotic camera of other large fights. In a vacuum, the gameplay of Sif is a little bit above average, but nothing that really stands out in any big way. Maybe a B grade. Where Sif does stand out, far above most the rest of the roster of Dark Souls, is in her atmosphere. The design of this stark grey wolf wielding this baby blue blade drawn out of its master's grave is absolutely gorgeous. The music here also deserves a serious shout out. The melody of this song is lonely in such an incredible and unique way, and the quiet violin notes create this depressing atmosphere. And then, as if that atmosphere needed more, Sif starts to limp at low health. Her damage drops to nothing, and her animations change. The fight is done, and you have to finish her off. This is the kind of heartbreaking detail that makes a boss memorable, and it really helps the end of the fight evolve into a climax, which is something many other fights in Dark Souls don't really do. It's a hard choice as to if Sif belongs with a high A grade, or if she does earn that first S grade. Even with the simpler gameplay, the amount of atmosphere and story packed into a completely wordless encounter is incredible. Sif is one of the greatest accomplishments of not only Dark Souls, but of the FromSoft gaming catalog, and I think that she does earn the first S grade. After the first three Lord Souls had fairly disappointing showings, the Four Kings finally managed to be the first that doesn't stumble at the finish line. Upon landing in the Abyss, the first king spawns and fights you alone. After a certain amount of time, additional kings will continue to spawn one at a time, but each king has its own health bar equal to a quarter of their shared health bar, meaning you can take one out before the next king spawns in. Though the four kings is the great foe of all challenge runners, it stands out as a lord soul that feels like an endgame challenge. The area to get to it is suitably difficult, and needing a specific ring to dive into the abyss and stand on nothing carries a weight that sets the four kings apart just from their design alone. Combine that with a particularly intense soundtrack and the four kings feels 
important, even being the only of the four souls not introduced in the opening. In terms of gameplay, the Four Kings boast a detailed and diverse moveset in theory, but they do struggle in execution. Depth perception becomes a significant issue with their ranged and grab attacks in particular, but their melee attacks are incredibly satisfying to dodge through and around. The damage is a bit strangely balanced. Some melee attacks deal almost no damage, and others will do about half a health bar with no discernible way to tell which is which. Once a second king spawns, though, it becomes impossible to avoid damage reliably. Their moveset requires the constant attention of the player, and half of their bodies being below the player's ground level means once you're surrounded, the camera struggles significantly. Attacks coming from behind can feel unfair, and the kings are almost immobile, which means separating them is not realistic. This fight is a damage test. If you cannot kill a king before the next one spawns, you will be swarmed and you will be killed. The gimmick does help to justify the unfair design, but it can still become frustrating if you don't have enough damage for the fight. Though the fight is entertaining enough, particularly with the visual gimmick, one final small criticism is that if you kill a king before the next spawns, you have to stand and wait for the timer to summon the next boss. It's a strange design choice because it makes the fight lose a great deal of momentum if you're succeeding. Overall, I think the four kings earn a solid B grade. They're an above average fight, particularly off their atmosphere and style, and they're definitely an easy pick for the best of the four Lord Souls. Kicking off the list of DLC bosses is the Sanctuary Guardian who comes out of the gate swinging. The Sanctuary Guardian has a small health pool but makes up for it with his aggression and speed. Even with a fast weapon, it can be tough to land a solid hit on this Manticore Chimera thing. On top of that, he's got an arsenal far more varied than the rest of the base game. He's got swipes, bites, air bursts, flying charges, electric projectiles, stings, and sweeps. Especially considering some bosses in the main game barely have three attacks, the Sanctuary Guardian raises the bar with the sheer detail packed into an inconsequential encounter. The Sanctuary Guardian may not matter as a boss, but he matters as a tone setter. He introduces what you have stepped into. There's not much else to say about the Sanctuary Guardian, though. It sets an expectation for a faster-paced DLC, this moves it as detailed and satisfying, and a low health pool stops him from ever becoming too much of a roadblock. He serves more as a check that you're properly leveled for the DLC than a massive challenge. For that, the Sanctuary Guardian earns an A grade. Artorius is a turning point in how Dark Souls designs bosses. The speed, aggression, way unique moves are chained together, and the cutscene building to the fight, Artorius was not the first to do any of these things, but he was the first to bring them together into one package that then formed a template that we see echoing even in Elden Ring. Artorius' introduction cutscene does a great job, building up not only the boss, but giving hints as to how to react to his later attacks. He's hunting monsters of the abyss when he sees you. Abyssal energy flows into him, and he seems to become faster and more powerful as he flings the corpse your way. One neat little detail is that the corpse stays there for the rest of the game. The big hint in this cutscene is that abyssal energy charge. At two points throughout the fight, Artorius will retreat and try to reabsorb that energy. If he gets the move off, he does more damage, attacks faster, and takes even less damage. But if you run forward and interrupt him, you can stagger him and stop his buff from ever going off. It's a great mechanic, and building it into the cutscene is a great way to set the stakes. In terms of the fight itself, Artorius follows Sanctuary Guardian's lead for the tempo of the fight. Artorius has a myriad of ways to close the distance. He has dash attacks and leaps that can get him next to you in a moment from almost anywhere in the arena. He has this backhand that doesn't do much damage but staggers you out of greedy attacks or a sloppy roll. His sweeps, spins, and slashes are all solid moves as well, each with unique ways to react to them and punish. They're varied enough that he never feels repetitive, but simple enough to not ever be overwhelming. Unlike many bosses, Artorius does not rely on spectacle with most of his attacks. The only one that even drifts into form of a function is this long jumping dive attack. His spins are also great. He usually spins twice, forcing you to position carefully or back up before heading back into melee range. Combined with his easier to dodge swipes, it creates this great game of cat and mouse, particularly considering Artorius is an endurance fight. He has a ton of health. Well, I should say more accurately he has a ton of resistances, but it still plays out in a similar way. 
There's not much in the game that matches Artorius' endurance, particularly considering that he can use a roll to separate himself from you, and he fairly regularly does so. One other point of success in the boss is the music. Unlike the other DLC bosses, Artorius boasts a somber, unsettling score. Combined with one of his arms being broken, the fight puts you against this hero that you've seen the name of everywhere in the game, and perhaps even robbed the grave of. But even with an arm broken, he is one of your greatest foes yet. There's an intensity to this song that I adore. Unlike Sif, who just manages to sneak into the S-grade, Artorius lands easily among the best the series has to offer. The effort that went into his design shines through in every aspect, from moveset to animation to design to atmosphere. Artorius easily takes the title for my personal favorite boss in the first Dark Souls game. When I did a Soul Level 1 playthrough of Dark Souls, there was only one boss that I could never beat the Black Dragon Calamite. The entire DLC is optional, but Calamite is optional even within that list and serves as the first dragon boss fight in the series. I do not count Seath, because Seath is a living crystal pus sack and thus not a real dragon. Designing a dragon boss fight is an incredible challenge in any game. As a winged monster, the designer first has to justify why this monster would ever stay on the ground to fight fairly and it's hard to toe the line between feeling like an overwhelming, legendary power that the player overcomes, and feeling unfair. Calamite, for From Software's first real attempt, does a pretty solid job. When you find Calamite, he's fighting the way you'd expect an intelligent dragon to fight, which is to say, not fighting you at all. He just covers the arena with fire, never staying in range for longer than he needs to. It's not until you find Go, or Goff, and get him to shoot down Calamite that you get an opportunity to fight this crippled dragon. He can still fly, but only in short bursts before he smashes back to the ground. In terms of moveset, Calamite again joins the Guardian and Artorius with a massive selection. Though, unlike the Guardian and Artorius, his animations occasionally struggle to communicate what his attacks are doing. He has bites, swipes, a charge, a flying charge, a straight fire breath, a fire breath behind him, a fire breath below him, a spinning attack, and one of the most unique grabs in the game. He grabs you, makes you regret wearing headphones, don't worry, I'm not gonna play the sound, and then he drops you with no damage taken. The debuff he places on you makes you take double damage from all sources for a short time, which is a really fun idea for a grab attack. He also ends up dropping a ring that does the same thing if you really hate yourself in New Game Plus. The only attack that doesn't feel great is the grounded charge. Calamy tenses up and then darts forward with his entire body turning into a hitbox. I don't know what it is about this animation in particular to me, but I always felt it looked silly. The bite also doesn't bite, it's more of this nose stab thing, which again looks a little silly. But at the end of the day, these are pretty small issues overall. In a game with animations that are usually so clear and crisp, these attacks do feel out of place, but the design holding them together is still pretty tight. My biggest problem, though, is that Calamite's fight goes on a little too long for the amount of spectacle he offers. Artorius has the highest resistance, but Calamite has the health, and backs it up with being pretty dodgy in his own right. He's definitely still an above-average boss fight, but he doesn't quite nail it for me. He earns a decent A grade. And wrapping up the DLC is the father of the Abyss himself, and my choice for the hardest boss in the game, Manus. Manus honestly feels more like a Dark Souls 3 boss. The rest of the DLC moves faster than the base game, and then Manus puts them all to shame. First, Manus's hand is introduced before he is. He's the one that drags you into the DLC, which starts to build up his design. At the end of everything, when you ascend down to the bottom of the abyss and that same hand pulls you into the arena, you get this incredible introduction cutscene revealing Manus' full design. As I said before, I am not too much of a character artist, but Manus' design hits perfectly for me. He is intimidating, and the use of this grey and red against the black environment makes him feel tied to his arena without cluttering the screen in the same way bosses like Centipede Demon did. In terms of moveset, Manus is all about range. Wherever you are in the arena, Manus can and will do something to you. He covers ground ridiculously fast, his staff has a deceptive range, and his arm can grow like he's Reed Richards. 
He has jumping attacks, swipes, magic, slams, and this 5-hit combo that you can't escape once being hit even once. It is a brutal onslaught. I think one of my favorite things about Manus is that the weight Dark Souls does so well in terms of boss attacks is still there. Manus recoils from the force of his own attacks just from the sheer force. Manus's atmosphere manages to capture this great feeling where the fight almost blurs by. He moves so quickly and with so much aggression that you don't have the opportunity to check how far you are in the fight or ever really reset. The fight is non-stop, start to finish. This makes Manus feel like an incredible endgame challenge and will set a precedent for DLC final bosses for the rest of the series. However, Manus is not perfect. I am not a huge fan of his magic spells. I dodge them all correctly here, but the margin of error to avoid being taken out, often in one shot by this barrage, is razor thin for both attacks. It is possible to get the silver amulet and use it, but menuing between the Estus and amulet clashes with how fast paced the fight ends up being, and I usually end up messing myself up rather than landing the already thin window required to block the shadow spells. Overall, though Manus's magic does frustrate, he stands as an incredible foe and a highlight of a Dark Souls run. He earns a high A grade. There's been a lot of discussion, one way or the other, on Gwyn as a boss design. Looking at his moveset, Gwyn should theoretically be the most overwhelming opponent in the game. His damage is ridiculously high, even compared to other endgame bosses, and he attacks with so much aggression, healing is rarely possible. He has a solid health bar, and he's hard to land a hit on as he also dodges around. He only has a few moves again. He's got a jumping attack, a two-handed sword combo, a fast slash, a one-handed sword combo, and an explosive grab. You can dodge an attack, heal the moment your roll is done, and he'll have already hit you before you've finished healing. But Gwyn is the only boss in the entire game who can be parried. And when he does, you get what is by far my favorite boss animation in the game. Gwyn is non-stop as a boss, lighting the arena around him with his sword as he paces around you, and he attacks with this frequency and brutality that surpasses even Manus. But the moment he gets parried, he stumbles to his knees and that light goes out, and you see what you are fighting. It's just another hollow. He takes so long to stand back up before this light bursts back into the arena, and if you know what you're doing, is snuffed out immediately. It creates an incredibly tense feeling if you aren't comfortable with parrying, but if you can keep him down, the fight goes from an overwhelming storm to the somber final moments of the life of a god. This, in my mind, is where the music comes in. As a lone piano, Gwyn's theme is one of the best pieces of video game music of all time. It keeps your attention regardless of if Gwyn is aggressive or being parried to oblivion. If he's aggressive, the keystrokes drive home the importance of where you are. This is the final battle. This is the end. And if he's being parried, it's playing for him as you snuff out the last echoes of his great age. With that said, Though I appreciate the fight regardless of the tempo, his aggression can often feel like a little too much. Without parrying, Gwyn is frustratingly difficult to the point I've seen a lot of new players struggle until they hear about his massive weakness. Gwyn is an amazing boss, and I think the fact that he can be parried makes him a stronger boss than he otherwise would have been. With both styles considered, I think Gwyn earns a solid place at the top of the A grade. And that's it. That's every boss in Dark Souls analyzed and graded. On screen now, you can see my ranking of each of the bosses from worst to best, with Seath bringing up the rear and Artorias at the top. This was a fun project to take on, and next on the list is Dark Souls 2, which boasts a roster of 41 boss fights, so that'll take a couple of minutes to wrap on up. Let me know your favorite and least favorite boss until then, and I'll see you in the next video.